It's time for Who's Who Tonight. Interesting topics, fascinating people. And now, your host of Who's Who Tonight, Mark Bishop. Tonight's guest was born in Canton, Ohio. In the late 60s, she, along with her six brothers and mother, were one of the most musically talented families to hit the top of the pop charts, with hits like Lorraine the Park and other things, Indian Lake, and Hair. They were also the inspiration of the hit TV show, The Partridge Family. Will you please welcome, from the group The Cow Sills, multi-talented musician, vocalist, and songwriter, Miss Susan Cowsill. Susan, welcome to Who's Who tonight. Well, thank you very much, Mark, and it is my pleasure to be a who of who's who. Now, Susan, uh, being the baby of seven in a musical family, I think it's safe to say you pretty much grew up from day one as a performer surrounded by an audience. Um, that's very, very true. I mean, you know, I mean, pre-seven was pretty, pretty regular kid activity, except for that I had a rock and roll band in the back room of my house, my brother's before I was in the band, but pretty much after around seven or eight, that was my daily life. I was actually more comfortable on stage than off just because we spent so much time there. And right. it was fun. It was like uh, being at the circus all the time. All right, Susan. Well, aside of the music aspect of growing up, how was it growing up with six older brothers and you being the only daughter? It was... Um, they mistook me for a football on many occasions. <laughs> um, my brother Paul always likes to say that it's a miracle that I'm alive because when I came along, you know, there were six little Indians and they just kind of threw me in the back of the, you know, the bike rack and took off with me. And they, Paul said that they would forget that, that I was a baby and that I was a girl. <laughs> so, um, and then coming up, you know, later on, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of testosterone running around in that house. And then I ended up in their in their rock band, which I think kind of harshed their mellow just a little bit, just to have your pesky sister um, now infiltrating what you thought was going to be, you know, they thought they were going to be the next Rolling Stones or the Beatles or something. Right. <laughs> I kind of put a squelch on that. But it was it was good, you know. I mean, I didn't have any sisters, and frankly, I really didn't want any. I liked I like being with the guys and um they were they were fairly decent to me. Now they're very good to me. They treat you like a little queen. So your career technically started in nineteen sixty seven? Yeah. Now being in the situation your family was in at the time, your first hit, The Rain, The Park and Other Things, was soaring up the musical charts worldwide in sixty seven, which established the councils as a prominent musical group. Was becoming a member of the band expected of you, or was this something you desired? Oh, yeah. I definitely, that was all my doing, and I spent the good part of my sixth and seventh year working the program. Uh, you know, I I saw what the guys were doing, and, it, and you know, music was in our house, um, you know, every day, and... I don't think I knew, of course, how can you know when you're six or seven years old at the time, but I'm, I'm a musician. I mean, I'm a an, I'm an musical artist, and I wanted to do what they were doing. The only problem was I really, I couldn't do it yet. I couldn't, you know, it's just a baby. Right. You know, I couldn't sing. And my brother Bill, you know, he, granted they had this band with the, with the boys in it, and, you know, it's all fair, fine and well that they're young and that's cute, but Bill had a real uh, criteria for quality. And cute was not, um, you know, that didn't get you a ticket in. You had to be able to sing. You had to be able to, to play, you know, you know, to, to actually be um, a musical um, uh, contribution. So um, I begged and pleaded. They'd stick me in a corner with a tambourine just to shut me up. Uh, you know, my brother Bill said, you know, you probably will end up being able to sing, but right now you can't, so go go get us some Kool-Aid. <laughs> One day, uh, as the story goes, we were in the car together. He was taking me, picking me up from school or something, and evidently I was harmonizing along with a monkey song, and he looked at me and went, oh, my God, there she is. And uh, I got an audition. I actually had to audition. You had to audition for your own family band? 
Yeah. Can you imagine? So I had to pick a song that I wanted to sing for everyone. I wanted to sing Love Child, but um, nobody wanted to hear that. So um, <laughs> I, guess, I didn't know what it was about. It was a great song. So uh, I auditioned with Sweet Talking Guy and the rest of it. When the Cal Sills Indian Lake hit the top 10 in 1968, you became the youngest person to be directly involved in a top 10 hit record. Now, I didn't were, know that. Uh, oh, I did my research. But uh, were you aware of that at that time? That was just, uh, you know, Casey Kasem doing his research. Or <clears throat> Actually, the way I found that out is pretty funny because I think it was somewhere around 19, uh, early 80s, and I was watching uh, television one morning. And Casey Kasem, you know, he used to have that top 10 thing he used to do. Right. And then he had a question and answer moment, you know, and that somebody would, you know, write in and ask a question. And somebody wrote in and asked who was the youngest female on a, on a top 10 rock record. That was the criteria. Rock record. And, and I'm sitting there watching, and I wasn't thinking much of it at all, you know, because I'm just watching TV. And I thought, well, that's an interesting question. Really did not even dawn on me. <laughs> and so I'm just chilling, watching, you know, after this break. And the guy comes back. <laughs> And Casey Kingston goes, the answer to Virginia's from, you know, Toledo, Ohio's question is Susan Cowsill, this big picture of me comes up on the screen, and I mean, it really took me aback. I bet you that was cool. It was. I mean, it was it was just kind of surrealistic, because, I mean, here we are, 1982, maybe, and, and the world has gone on, and I'm not even close to being in that world anymore. Right. And I thought it was cool, and then... And then he said that Michael Jackson was the youngest male, and I thought that was pretty, that was awesome. Wow, so you sh you share a category with Michael Jackson. I do, I do, and I'm proud of it. And it wasn't designed that way. It wasn't designed. <laughs> cool. Now, Susan, tell us about life on the road at that time. Uh, I mean, at that time, you were highly sought after. Yeah. Not only for concerts and personal appearances, but... It seemed like you were on just about every talk show and variety show at the time. I mean, we're talking Ed Sullivan show, Johnny Cash show, Mike Douglas show, D. Martin show, just to name a few. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Um, you know, so it was the that was the peak of our, I'd say, like sixty eight and sixty nine were our busiest years, and we, uh, you know, we were on tour all year long. We we barely barely went to school, which didn't break any of our hearts, needless to say. Right. Um, but, and, 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 you know, yeah, we, if, you know, it wasn't overnight, of course, because it never is, but when it kicked in, it was, it was pretty uh, eminent, you know what I mean? I mean, it did just took off like gangbusters, and uh, it was exciting. It was freaking thrilling. I can I mean, imagine. I thought it was the best thing that any, you know, could happen to anybody. I mean, we were playing state fairs. Which means what? That means that I am in the vicinity of a roller coaster and a Ferris wheel <laughs> every day, you know. <laughs> you know, and so in between shows, that's all we did. You know, I mean, it was, and and driving around and seeing the world, and and it was it was really it was very special, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, with this hectic schedule that you all had to contend with, uh, did you ever find anxiety ever set in? Um, I wouldn't say anxiety, um, <clears throat> you know, exhaustion certainly did. And, and, and then, you know, although I can't, re you know, I only remember it in funny little ways, you know, about not being home for certain things, you know, and, uh, I remember I had a photo shoot on Easter Sunday once. I thought that was kind of messed up. Yeah, I thought that was not, you know, necessarily a good plan for me for that day. Um, Christmas, the first Christmas that we were, uh, in New York City, that, that since Christmas of 67, we were, uh, we did a Ed Sullivan show. Right. And, and that's live. And so what does that mean? That means it's Christmas Eve and I'm in a TV studio, not at home, in bed, waiting. And what I've been told all my life is that this guy's not coming till I'm asleep and it's like 10 o'clock and I'm still up the street. So that was that was stressful to me beyond words, and uh, and then uh, unfortunately the night rambled on and there was a small Christmas party going on in our very tiny apartment in Manhattan, 
And that was tripping me out, too. So, I mean, you know, there were some moments that, as a child, you know, I could have uh, had it a different way and been perfectly happy. Right. On a whole, and all in all, you know, um, I, it, there wasn't stress for me. I wasn't stressed out being in a band. I really dug it. And again, I think it's just because it's what I was born to do. Now, yeah. now, the Ed Sullivan Show, I mean, I think that's every every musician's dream, if they could go back yeah. in time to be on the Ed Sullivan Show. Um, how clearly do you remember being on the Ed Sullivan Show? Do you, do you remember the process of how you guys were booked, and was there rehearsal time? Tell us about that, because that's very fascinating. Yeah, it really was very fascinating, and I'm so happy to say that I absolutely remember. I remember all of it, and, uh, you know... Probably a good deal helps is that there are films and things you know to see. But but I've but I remember I remember rehearsals. I remember going to the the theater. You know, we lived right down the street on Eighth uh, Avenue, fifty second and fifty third, and then the Ed Sullivan Theater is right up the, right up the corner. Correct. And uh, I do remember going in. I remember uh, just walking. I remember looking for Topo Gijo. <laughs> I wanted to know where he was. I wanted to meet him, um, you know, because I'm eight. Uh, and Ed's, you know, and standing with Ed. And, and the cool, but here's the cool part. You know, my brothers, in 1964, we were all sitting in front of our TV like the rest of the world, watching Ed, watching the Beatles. And, and my brothers, they were like, you know, we, we want to do that someday. And not three years later, man, there they were. Wow. You know, and that pretty special that you can't buy anything like that on a on a on a, a personal dream uh, machine you know and you know it, it's amazing how many musicians were inspired and a lot of careers started just by that one show with the beatles on uh, on the ed sullivan show well it, it showed it showed um a new a new potential i mean rock and roll was so young even, even you know, as 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 much as it had been going on, you know, it started in the fifties, as you know, but it was really hitting a whole new height in the sixties, and and to be a part of that, even when I look back at it now and I see all these bands and all these labels, and and now the lack of labels and the demise of the record industry, and I'm just you know the the evolution of the whole thing, and uh, you know, having been involved in the very very the very baby um, baby portion of it is that's pretty cool too, and it makes me feel old as Methuselah. Yeah, but um, <laughs> it's also very it's it's a cool thing, you know. I, I'm I'm a really lucky lucky girl. Wonderful life. Yeah, it seemed like the Ed Sullivan Show became like a rite of passage. Once you performed on the Ed Sullivan Show, all the doors were opened. It's kind of like how uh, Saturday Night Live is, is really the equivalent of Ed now. Right. You know, if you're on Saturday Night Live, you're you're doing it. You're there. You made it. And uh, it really did. It it didn't. It's Ed started the whole ball rolling. I mean, we had our own TV special in 1969 on NBC. Um, you know, the whole Partridge Family thing got started way back then. That was supposed to be our show. I mean, it was designed, created, and thought up for us. Really? So it was supposed to be the Cowsill family instead of the Partridge family? Correct. And, and you know, it took them two years to develop it. And by the time they got to us, we weren't those cute little kids anymore. It was, you know, because, uh, you know, we started in 67, and that's really when it all started coming down. And uh, I think it was 69 or something like that. Maybe it was 68, 69, I think. When they finally came to, us, you know, they came out to our house and stayed with us and just went, well, I don't think so. <laughs> and and there was a lot of other things going on. They wanted Shirley Jones to be the mom. My dad was absolutely not. Um, so, but and that's that's quite all right. We had uh, really we were not. I remember at the time disappointed at all because we were we were pretty tired by then, and the thought of adding that to the docket, and especially. I do remember thinking at that time as a kid going, you know what? I will never see my bike again if we get this freaking TV show. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never ride a bike on my own block again. And I'm sure at that time you probably had a lot of pressure on you. 
Yeah, I, I, I didn't really see it as pressures. I saw it as, I want to go to camp. I'd like to be a brownie. I could use some braces. They say I should have a tonsillectomy. <laughs> I was seeing it more like, like real life stuff that I was missing out on. But it had anybody asked me at that time, okay, so you're traded in and then you can be a brownie and get your tonsils out, I, I would have said, nah, that's okay. You know, if I could do it both, I would. But I didn't ever feel pressure or stress regarding playing. And again, I think that is because it's what I do. I think maybe if I was just a, I don't know, if if I was just a go along, you know, with the family, just for the hell of it kind of a thing, I might have felt differently, but I was so connected to the music right. that it was so um, soul-feeding uh, that I, I it didn't feel like that to me. Right. You know, I mean, we had stress, but it wasn't from the business. Well, you know, it's like uh, if you do something that you love to do as a job, it never really feels like a job. And it never has, and and it, and it never will, you know. And sometimes it, it doesn't act like a job either because sometimes there's no payday. But, hey, that's just the, the deal you make uh, at the crossroads, as it were. Now, with all of this going on in your lives, how did you guys even manage to have time for an education? Well... Quite honestly, Mark, we didn't. And, you know, that falls in the laps of my folks. And as a parent, I think it's pretty unforgivable that that part was let go. Um, not to say that school is the beat-all, end-all, because I think you can get an education. You can get a scholastic education at the library. Absolutely. You know, everything that we're taught is, is, is in one big building. But the idea of going to school and learning how to learn and learning structure and learning, you know, how to be in a society of little people, you know, <laughs> um, we didn't have that opportunity. And the deal was that, you know, my, my parents, they were, you know, they're depression kids. I don't think my dad made it to the third grade. I know my mom was out by the seventh. So I don't think they saw it as such a big deal. But, um, you know, we were supposed to have been being tutored on the road. And I think the first year we went out with it, when we were on MGM and there was so much focus on us, we did have a tutor on the road. But that was that. So I still can't long divide, Mark. It's really, now that stresses me out. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know the eight parts of speech. I know about three of them. But, you know, of all the experiences that you were having at that time, and you guys were all over the world, you probably ended up with a better education by learning things firsthand. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I went to uh, Italy, Spain, uh, London. Uh, you know, I, was, I went to the Vatican. I saw the catacombs. You know, and, and when I came, I was in the fourth grade. And I came back and did a, a report on it. You know what I mean? We did did the best we could in regards to that, but right. I would be a wreck if I thought my kids were living the life that I was living as far as their education goes. I would have lost my mind uh, over my dead body. And my kids even say, you know, you know, just because you didn't have to go, we get tortured by, you know, it being such an important thing. <laughs> and the truth is, I don't really think it, it is. I mean, it is important, but it's not, you know, a life-threatening situation if you don't have proper education. I think there's other ways. Now, I can imagine being on the world circuit like you guys were at the time. It must have been really hard for any of you to have close personal friends other than your family. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, we weren't home that much. So, I mean, I always had, I had a best friend, you know, one, I always had one best friend. And, and when I was home, you know, we went to school together, you know, um, that, that's who I'd play with. And, you know, and then there were, we went to a school, um, called Hollywood Professional School, and it was for actors and actresses and musicians, kids who work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we'd hang out there. I mean, um, Maureen McCormick from Brady Bunch, she was a buddy of mine. Oh, cool. We were pretty pretty good friends. And um, But for the most part, you know, um, you know, because for at least four to five years, my life centered around working, no, and in fact, when we'd be on the road, to my dad's credit, which he doesn't get much of, understandably, you know, like on Halloween, there were at least two occasions where after the show, because back in those days, we did kind of early concerts, mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he'd rally up some 
fans, some kids and their parents, you know, to take me trick-or-treating. I've been trick-or-treating. I mean, I love to see those, you know, find those people who, you know, because they were out of their minds with joy <laughs> to, be, to be taking me. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and I made friends on the road. If we ever stayed anywhere for more than a week, I made friends with whoever was in the hotel, you know, kids my age. And quite honestly, there are a handful of fans from back in the day that I that, that followed us around that were around my age. Of course, they were just there because they love my brothers, but whatever. <laughs> and, you know, to this day, I'm still in touch with these people. We've known each other since we were eight and nine years old, you know. Yeah, and they were my buddies. I mean, if we played somewhere for a few days, they their parents would plop down at the same hotel, and we'd go to the pool and hang out. You know, so it all it all worked out. It seemed like when the seventies arrived, you guys just kind of slowly went your separate ways. Yeah. Now, was there one particular instance that caused you guys to drift apart, or was it just a combination of things? Yeah, well, it was a lot of things. You know, um, I think on a base level, in most families, the natural progression and evolution of things is for kids to grow up, go to college, move away, go get a life, you know, one by one. That's what they do. Right. And we weren't doing that because we were in business together, um, which complicates things. You know, when, when older guys, older kids are growing and want their own individual lives, and that's just not, you know, that's not conducive necessarily to what we were doing. And my dad had a, you know, he had a ruling thumb, and that played into it as well. Musically, the the boys wanted to move into some music that they were more growing into that wasn't necessarily the cow seal sound, and that was, you know, an issue. Right. And just the times, it's 1969, it's time to smoke pot, it's time to do drugs, it's time to rebel. And, you know, my boys were, you know, they weren't going to miss out on all that. <laughs> so really, just a matter of all things, and, and, and business falling apart. My dad um, was a military guy. He had no business knowledge. He found who he thought to be trusted um, counsel, and they actually just ended up ripping us off. Um, but, I don't know, we're in a lawsuit right now, hopefully to get the rights to our royalties back. We've never been paid. <laughs> Is that true? And Yeah, it's really true. That's a shame. Totally true. It's a shame, but you know what? If it can be rectified, then it, then it, then justice will be done and and move forward from here. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but uh, the, the, in about, I guess it was seventy two. You know, everybody was ready to go to fly the coop, and they did, and left me standing there holding the bag. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Where did everybody go?" <laughs> now, at that time, did you guys just decide to give it a break, or did you officially break up? Yeah, no, we, we gave, the band broke up officially in 72. And and everybody, yeah, I mean, the older guys and their new families they were starting, they went their ways. You know, some of them, my old, oldest brother, Bill, he always played. He never stopped playing music. Um, my brother Bob took a break for a while. Uh, my brother Barry never stopped. I never stopped. Um, my life took a very strange turn in where I, you know, there was no band and I um, was plopped down into eighth or ninth grade, told to go to school, and I had no clue what I was doing. Wait, you can't do that. You know, I don't even, I can't long divide. I can't just jump in here. And uh, I kind of got myself out of my house at a very young age and was set out on making my own way. And, I mean, I had a record deal when I was 16 years old with Warner Brothers, my own. Mm -hmm. And... uh um, you know, didn't it didn't do anything but keep me out of school. My mom, <laughs> I made a deal with her. She let me leave and go take, you know, be the grown up business working person I was. That right. That if I, if I did that, she'd let me quit school. Now, now what year was altogether. that? What year was it that you were um, with Warner Brothers? Ah, I think it was seventy four. Was it? I was sixteen. Okay. So maybe seventy four, seventy five. Yeah. And that is where and when, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Sixto Rodriguez. Are you familiar with Rodriguez? Uh, yeah, uh, Rodriguez. 
and the, and the Searching for Sugar Men documentary, yes. that whole thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I had record I had recorded one of his songs uh, back then, oh. unbeknownst to me. And when this whole documentary and everything came out, um, it was revealed that <laughs> one of the six songs that I re- uh, recorded in that deal was one of his. And I met him, and he invited me to come play with him. And I opened up for him at the Barclay Center in Brooklyn just uh, last October. In this, yeah, so that was pretty exciting. Yeah, I actually saw that on your Facebook page. It was you and your husband Russ and Rodriguez. Now, now he also goes just by the name Rodriguez. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was really cool. So, you know, I mean, I never stopped playing music either. I just kept going. And then the Cousels, we got back together again in 77 or 8, and then in the 80s. And we never, when you're a family band, Mark, there is no break. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> there was just a little vacation. And, and you know, because it's, I think it, it has so much to do with, like, the mysterious DNA molecular structure of, humans who make music anyway and then when you're related and that's what you did you know you have a yearning to, to make that sound again together it's just like you do if you're a singular artist you've got to do what you do absolutely you know it's part of who you are so you imagine five people connected you know bloodline and lifestyle for years i mean that's just that's a hard thing to let go of and so we lost my brother barry and bill we've we it's even more important just to play together because it, it fills a a hole, and it, it, it creates a bond that, that heals. It's awesome. Now, in 1985, you lost your mom. Yes. Yeah, mom passed away of emphysema in 85, and uh, that was a sad, very mm-hmm. unfortunate and unnecessary, but, you know, we make our choices in life. And she was, God, she was only 56. So was she a smoker? Yeah, couldn't quit. In fact, when we were playing in 1969 at the Steel Pier, I remember it was the weekend of the moon launch, and we were at the Steel Pier, and uh, she had pneumonia. She had a hole in her lung, and they told her, you do not have good lungs, and if you don't quit, this is going to happen, and this is exactly what happened. Mm, What a shame. Yeah, I miss my mama. She was a good girl. She had a beautiful voice. Now, in the 80s, You went on to loan out your vocal skills to several popular touring artists and bands like uh, Dwight Twilley, uh, The Smithereens, Hootie and the Blowfish, among others. Yes, I have definitely, I I loaned my vocal skills to Dwight along with, you know, many meatloaves. (laughs) Right. He was was my boyfriend for almost 10 years. Dwight Twilley? Yeah. It's funny, I met Dwight when he was doing a guitar project in Baltimore with Greg Ken. That's right. That makes sense. I remember yeah. that. I was, he was, uh, I think we were still together. I'm not sure. We still record with Dwight and we're buddies. Just kind of uh, been a voice, you know. I mean, that's what I do primarily. I'm a singer. I write songs, but I, I don't I don't like to necessarily say that that's who I am and what I do. Um, a, because it's, there's stress and, and ex. ex- expectations um, from people on that and singing is, and it really is my, my first nature and I've, I've oh God I've sang on so many amazing um, productions of people's music and made such beautiful friends um, through it that uh, I don't know I don't know it's, it's rather charmed if you ask me <laughs> now I have a lot of friends and family who are huge fans of Hootie and the Blowfish, and you worked with them as well. Yes, the Hootie Boys. My ex-husband, Peter Holsapple, who is from the DBs and also played with R.E.M. for many years, um, when the guys were first coming on to their fame and fortune, they called up uh, for Peter to come be their side guy, um, their keyboard, you know, their go-to guy, their fifth Hootie, their, his, their fifth fish. <laughs> and I became very good. I've known Mark and Darius and... Dean and Sony since they were kids. Yeah, it's very sweet. And, you know, naturally um, formed a musical kin- kinship with them as well. They're wonderful people. They're really good guys. They've grown up to be very nice men and very talented as well. Now, Susan, in 2003, you married drummer Russ Broussard. I did. So how did you guys... Uh, Meet? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we met 
in 1990, oh, let's see, I was pregnant, so it was probably 1993, and he was in another band, and we were, I was in the Continental Drifters with my then-husband, and Vicki Peterson, my best friend um, from the Bangles, she was in the Drifters as well, and we met at a party of a, the, of a mutual management slash record company we were both on, mm-hmm. and just, you know came across a room heading for my very pregnant stomach with his hands extended without even asking permission. Um, and <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. And then a few years later, he joined the Continental Drifters because he's just one of the most amazing drummers on the planet. And if I hadn't married him, I would have hired him. So I don't know who got the better end of the deal. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. <laughs> But um, And we were in a band together for many years. We were really good buddies for years throughout the band time and only buddies. And then as life will take its turns, you know, my, my marriage to Peter went south. And uh, he had been married as well, and that took a turn. And we found ourselves uh, being more than best friends at the end of the run. And we've been married for 10 years. We've been together for 12, but we've known each other for 20. That's awesome. It's pretty cool. And he writes with me, he um, co-writes all the songs with me, and and he does all the important things of remembering where we're supposed to be and when we're supposed to be there and who we're supposed to see when we go. So I can, he's a hard-working, hardest-working man in my show business. So you and Russ get married in 2003. You're, You're living in Louisiana. Things are really happening for you. And then just two years later, several personal tragedies. Uh, well, you know, we had Katrina. Right. And we lost my brother Barry to the muddy waters of the Mississippi in that event. And that was in August. Um, or, yeah, I was in August, late August. And then uh, in February the next year, my brother Bill passed away, who had been very sick for quite a while. He had, um, he had, uh, he had run his body ragged from being a, a child of the 60s and and a complicated genius of an artist. And though he was, uh, he reached uh, continuous sobriety in the later years of his life, his body took a toll, you know. And so the day we were having Barry's memorial in February, he passed away on the very day. Wow. And uh, we all have theories about that with the slightly twisted Castle Sense of Humor we often think that Bill thought Barry was getting too much press. And as the leader of the band, <laughs> that he did not appreciate that, and he was going to one-up him. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, um, I don't know if you're familiar with our music. We have a song called Two by Two that my brother Bill wrote. And if you look at the lyrics, uh, it basically says, you know, we're going to go two by two down the road. Uh, we, you know, where one goes, the other's going with. Mm. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know what happened with Billy on that particular day, but um, it was, a, it was a twofer for sure. It had to be absolutely devastating. Yeah, it was. It was. We knew Bill was sick. You know, it was just a strange timing. But that's what life does to you sometimes. Now, Susan, in 2011, Showtime put out a movie called Family Band: The Council Story. Can you tell us about the movie? is a documentary that we actually um, uh, were very um, involved in making. So this was a, a concerted project that all of you had your hands in? Yeah, it was. Um, it took over, well, I don't know, over, but it took at least 10 years to make. Um, we kind of halted the process over and over again, not having the right people on board and it taking too dark of an angle. Um, you know, and quite honestly, I know if you've seen it, it, it's got, you know, unfortunately, the truths are the truth, and it was a documentary, and we agreed to it, and uh, that's why we wanted to be very involved, because in most documentary um, circumstances, the artist or the the subject is kind of, you know, takes a back seat once um, once it's agreed that it's going to be done, and we were pretty adamant about that, and, uh, you know, that we needed to be involved. It's our story. Right. And and didn't want people, you know, making it any worse than it was, or or, or making it, you know, any un, any more unrealistic than some of those things can be. So it was like you guys were all on board for quality control. 
big time, big time quality control. And you know, and I know um, it's it's a pretty heavy and heavy story, but life can be like that, you know. And it's also very inspirational because um, you see a bunch of people who came out the other side um, with gratitude and and love in their hearts. So I think I think it works, you know. Never really know what to say when somebody goes. You know, when somebody tells you, oh, man, I got your record and I love it, you go, oh, wow, thanks. That's so thank you. When somebody walks up to you and goes, I saw your documentary. You know, I kind of want to go, are you okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get you something? Here, you want to see me some water? Here, sit down. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's almost like some people can handle things better than others, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's all good. It's life. You know, it's real. It's right. very real. All right, Susan. Well, let's talk about some of your current solo albums, or should I say CDs. In 2005, you released your CD entitled Just Believe It. Was that a joint effort between you and your husband, Russ? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Just Believe It um, was uh, the, the album that came out after that, Lighthouse, is totally Russ and I all the way down the, the middle. And a lot of Just Believe It was as well. But just believe it was, you know, and we were in the Continental Drifters for years, and Continental Drifters had certain songs, a certain genre. And as a songwriter, there were so many of us. We would bring our, our different songs to the table, and some of them were drifter material, quote-unquote, and some weren't. And so I was kind of pocket the non-drifter, the little too maybe pop, maybe a little too, uh, a little too, uh, yeah, pop <laughs> <laughs> songs. I kind of stuck them in a little box for someday maybe i'll make my own record and that day came and and there are a few on there that are from that 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 time but then there are there are also stuff that russ and i co-wrote together so you know i guess it's a compilation in, in that way but really for me because i really didn't think wasn't going to commit to or worry about having another one i just i wanted one really I wanted to make my one tapestry or my one Carla Bonoff record, you know, where I made sure that, you know, that I said what I had to say. Right. And I felt very much that I had done that with Just Believe It. And Just Believe It got released a couple of weeks after Katrina and really kind of, Katrina kind of, no pun intended, took the wind out of our sail on, on a project that we worked very hard mm. on, or very, you know, we're very passionate about right. that everything we had into it and that's what happened there and that's that's life's little journey and then you had two personal losses in your family at that time you know and and you know you can reflect on stuff like that i mean just believe it got amazing reviews david frick from rolling stone you know basically said i was you know the next you know the next deal you know a woman in her songwriting prime etc and then katrina came and, and nothing really mattered except for you know, my family and my hometown and, and what the freak just happened, you know? Correct. And it took a long time to recover from that. Um, too long, frankly, and I, I don't, if I ever get sideswiped again, I'm going to remember that, that that's life and, and to be wasting too much time. you got to spend some time in grief and mourning, but you can also spend, you know, you can overdo that and be missing the present moment. Right. And I feel like I really definitely did that um, in regards to uh, Katrina and maybe life in general. So it was about almost five years between records. Don't want to do that again, although I'm working on it because <laughs> Lighthouse came out in, I think, 2010. Yeah, and Lighthouse was your last CD that you released, correct? Yeah, and that was accompanied by the oil spill. <laughs> wow. I'm the, nat I'm the nat natural disaster record release queen. You can call them natural. Neither one of them was natural because our floods had nothing to do. Let's just say that our floods are a direct result of the um, Army Corps of Engineers' um, lack of doing their job properly. And that's just the facts that we know around here. Um, Katrina didn't help, but we made it through the storm okay. Levees broke, and they, they shouldn't have. That's a story for another day. And then the Gulf Spill came right on the heels or as we were releasing Lighthouse. And Lighthouse is a... Um, I really am proud. We are both very proud of Lighthouse. It's 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 our homage to the years since Katrina, you know, and 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 the getting through it. 
it's it's a bit heavy, I guess, in places. But mm-hmm. I think again, it's also you know, I got inspiration from writing, you know, and I'm hoping other people see and feel that. And most most people who've heard it or have it do recognize that. I mean, that's life. Life is heartbreakingly inspiring. Yes, <laughs> that's just the way it is. <laughs> You know, and so, you know, so now here we are, and it's 2013. Um, I definitely were working up to making another record. That's great. Uh, also may have a project with my sister-in-law slash best friend, Vicki Peterson, from the Bangles. And she and I have had a side project called the Psycho Sisters for 25 years. And uh, we, are, we finally recorded our album last May, or maybe it was the May before. Uh, and that's going to be released at the front of 2014. Awesome. Yeah, that's a trip. So any other future projects going on right now? Too many that I can even tell you. You know, we have, um, you know, all kinds of great ideas. Um, making a living in our industry has changed so dramatically. Yeah. You know, the old model of rec- make a record, uh, tour, sell records, okay, living made, that's no longer there due to internet, digital downloads, and just the shift of life. So we've had to kind of reinvent ourselves in some ways, but still staying within and true to what we do. And I think what um, we're going to branch out into, uh, along with always playing and always making records, um, is I want to do some workshops. I want to I want to share the knowledge minimal as it is, of songwriting, of music as a way of life, of music as a way of healing, of therapy. Um, and I, I would like to share what we do, what we know with other people, because you don't have to be out there trying to make a living off of it. It's a real soul-saving um, experience right. to create, and, and anybody can do it, especially if you're not trying to sell it. You know right. what I mean? It's like right. If it makes you feel good and it and it helps you express yourself, well, then, then that's good enough. People think they, you know, think that they don't know how to do that, and I, I beg to differ. So that's something we're looking into doing. And I've got, you know, so so that's that's something we're looking forward to. And, and there's always, um, we actually have a couple. Of, we're started doing this thing called um, it's called Stage It, and it's it's live concerts from our home <laughs> into your living room via the internet. Cool. And we did one last week, and it was a blast. And so anybody can go to stageit.com. And we're mm-hmm. gonna, um, we have a couple more coming up, um, one in December. I'm not sure what date we picked, but if you go to my website, susancouncil.com, or mm-hmm. Facebook page, you will see where that will be. So if you want to see a concert and you're in, in Kearney, Nebraska, and can't get out to New Orleans, then you can still uh, participate. And it's really fun because it's interactive. Y'all can... The, the audience can type messages and requests, and we can talk to them. And it's really fun. That's pretty neat stuff. Yeah, and I want to. I um, have been talking about forever, and actually, I'm going to actualize it. I think this year, I want to do um, like a little interview show, just on YouTube, probably. You know, and just kind of like a man about the street here in New Orleans. You know, just kind of go around and see what's on everybody's mind, because I like to do that. I'm a digger. So oh, there's all kinds of things. And then, you know, doing nothing is really fun, too. So I plan on doing a lot of that. In conclusion, I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm into the, the contribution phase of my life. Just to, you know, we want to we wanna, you know, do, do more with what we have, you know, um, on a service level. Because that's, that's, you know, you can only be told how wonderful you are, which is a beautiful gift, and I am not balking at it. But I'd rather... I'd rather do some, if, if, if that's the case, then, you know, what, what can we do with that to, to better, better stuff? I feel like a Miss America pageant chick. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make the world a better place to be. <laughs> well, that's what it's nice to use your notoriety to do good things. I mean, most music fans know who Susan Kelso is. Well, some of us old people do, Mark. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> Now, your website, SusanCalcil.com, can people go there for CD purchases and information on upcoming events? They can. You know, we're a PayPal organization. You can go, you can go directly to PayPal. Go to SusanCalcil.com. We try desperately to keep that up as, as much as we can and, and do. 
I also have two Facebook pages, which is just Susan Council, where a lot of information about what we're doing is at. And also, I would be neglectful to not mention that the councils are always playing, um, and and you need to keep your eye out. There's a, a councils Facebook page too, and the dot com. I'll let you know what we're up to as well. We're actually getting ready to do a cruise in January with Paul Revere and the Raiders, uh, B J Thomas, Nancy Wilson from the Supremes, and some other fun people. And there's always oh, the council concerts are a blast. So I highly um, recommend that to everybody out there. All right, folks. Remember, that's SusanCalsill.com. Mm-hmm. Now, Susan, before you go, and you probably get tired of doing this, and you probably know what I'm about to ask you to do. <laughs> I'm hoping you're not, but go ahead. <laughs> Can you please deliver that famous line of yours in the hit song, Hair? I can do it. And ironically, Mark, I'm going to see a production of Hair here in New Orleans tonight at the La Petite Theater. So I will give you one. And spaghetti! (laughs) I want to thank tonight's guest, Ms. Susan Council. Hope you had fun, Susan. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, it was a blast. Call me anytime. Well, that's it tonight for us at Who's Who Tonight. I'm Mark Bishop. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Who's Who Tonight with Mark Bishop. Visit us on YouTube and on Facebook, or go to our website, whoswhotonight.com.